All right, welcome back, Chemistry 241 guys. Hey, this is Dr. Porter. I uh, missed you guys, uh, still missing you guys, missing office visits, missing hanging out, missing review sessions and pizza and all the good times we had. I know this is not what we wanted, not what we expected, but uh, kudos for all of your hard work and your patience and uh, your willingness to keep up and stay engaged because that's that's the Wabash Always Fights way and um, we got to get through this and at the same time we need to learn um, some good materials and move on and get you prepared for moving on your courses hopefully in the fall when things kind of get back to uh, whatever normal is and, and we can get back at Wabash and enjoy being together but for right now we got to stay strong and keep moving forward and so uh, I know Dr. Cook has done a really good job moving forward with the unit, and he's done a lot of the lectures so far. I've been really working hard as well in the background, working on your literature projects and kind of uh, developing some new stuff for uh, thinking about how we can move forward with, uh, you know, how do we do paper homework and how do we do exams and things like that moving forward. So this is still a, a work in progress. We appreciate your patience. We're, we're moving forward. Um, and so just bear with us and keep Keep up the good attitude. I really appreciate the patience and definitely keep up the communication because if you let us know what's going on, if you communicate, we can work with you. It's when you know a few of you have kind of dropped, dropped off the radar and we kind of have to reach out uh, with an email to say, hey, reel you back in and, and let's let's stay on top of this and do a good job. That's when we get a little bit worried. So let's, let's you know, all we're all in this together, so let's keep on working. And I'm really excited to get back in and uh, you know, get in front of you with a lecture handout here. Um, I'm going to try to keep this reasonably short. I've really loaded this one up with a lot of cool stuff that I think is really exciting because you may not know this about me, but I'm an inorganic chemist, but my specialty in inorganic chemistry is both transition metals and solid state materials. So yeah, I get to do a little bit of materials chemistry and engineering as part of my uh, research. And, and traditionally, I've been a silicon chemist, and so I've done a lot of work with uh, developing new types of uh, molecules that bind to silicon wafers um, and, and nanoparticles and all kinds of things to think about how we might interface computers with molecules and nanoparticles to make really the next generation of computational devices, right? I mean, imagine that cell phone that you have right now, 10, 10 times better, right? That's, that's kind of what my my original research path uh, was looking at. And so uh, I'll give you a little hints of that today, but right now we're gonna dive right in, um, talking about a little bit of a shift, right? Dr. Cook talked about periodic trends and he kind of marched you across the periodic table. You you, you talked about the S uh, block and the P block and, and those are all really important and I think they're great connections to 111, right? Hopefully you, you recall that 241 is uh, a higher level course, but at the same time, we're making really just daily connections now, especially uh, to things we've done in the past. And I'm gonna try to keep up that trend and, and kind of show you some cool stuff along the way. So, uh, one little note real quick. Uh, one last thing before we get started. I'm, I've kind of given you some instructions in the Canvas website on how we're gonna move forward. This this uh, topic today, we are not, repeat, not gonna have a sapling due. I'm gonna try out with you guys a one page. I want to see you hand write your answers and kind of get back to what we were sort of doing before. Um, I think sapling's really helpful, but at the same time, you know, we gotta we gotta get in there and think about ways to move forward with exams and whatnot. So we're gonna try some of this scanned handwritten response stuff and I hope it goes pretty well because I think that's the best way uh, Dr. Cook and I can grade things and, and award you the um, partial credit and things like we used to do back at, at Wabash, right? So we're going to try try that out. We'll probably have a few little growing pains and figure out how to do a little bit better along the way. But hey, we're trying and that's all we can do. So all right, let's show you some cool stuff. So I've got a uh, solid snake here, uh, right? Uh, hopefully you're having a little bit of time to take some mental health breaks and play some video games. I know I've played a little bit. Um, and so uh, what are we talking about today? Well, we're talking about solids. And if you remember back uh, from Chemistry 111, right? Solids are, of course, the densest state of matter, right? Uh, that we deal with. You have the three phases, right? You've got liquids, um, solids, and gases. And we talked about the idea of phase uh, diagrams, right? And you're gonna need to go back if you need to, right? Uh, phase diagrams, right? And do you remember those? They look like you had what? You had uh, pressure and temperature, and then you had things that kind of looked like that, and you had to tell me uh, which state of matter was in each zone, and based upon what pressure and temperature you're at, you kind of had to talk about how that 
that um, connected. And so that's that's really important. You gotta you gotta think about that. And so we may have to review some of that uh, if you need it. Um, maybe we can do that in a conference uh, later on. But for right now, it wouldn't hurt to go back and look at your 111 notes on the three states and matters. Probably couldn't couldn't hurt. Okay, if you're a materials chemist or a 241 student or you're an engineer. Uh, solids are really important and that's pretty obvious because we build things we make crap out of solids right everything from concrete pvc pipe um you know steel beams and skyscrapers all that kind of stuff engineering is all about solids and so if you're going to think about solids why would you care about the chemistry of solids well right one of the most important mantras in chemistry is that structure Right, the structure at the atomic level dictates what? It dictates the physical and the chemical properties. Right, the properties are so direly important because that determines what applications can be used. So if you're gonna to try to build a skyscraper or a bridge, or you know, if you're gonna to try to make some kind of splint for an operation, a heart valve, artificial heart, you know, all these kinds of things, you have to know what that structure is or you're gonna be utterly lost or you're gonna hurt people, which is even worse. Um, and so thinking about that structure property relationship is really, really important. And if you think about it, we have a variety of types of solids, right? We have natural materials like cotton and wood and things like that. And then we have artificial or synthetic, right? We can make things like um, artificial polymers, right? We can make um, all kinds of alloys and things that don't exist in nature. Those are artificial or what we call synthetic. Um, if we go and think about your reading, your reading does a really good job of talking about um, two really important distinction of materials. So if we're gonna look at the structure, right, we need to think about how atoms and molecules are arranged at the atomic level, because that's really gonna be critical. Just like when 111, we talked about how things are bound together, how they're bound together is really important within a molecule. But now we get to zoom out just a little bit and think about how these molecules and individual atoms are arranged within the structure of a solid to think about the structure of not just what are the individual elements, but how are those elements arranged within a material so we can think about how we can explain the properties of something and therefore know which materials are good for which applications. And so if we look here, uh, we look at something called crystalline materials. And crystalline materials are really exciting. I, I love to study crystalline materials because if you, you, you can say we have our little um, ball here and that ball could represent either a molecule or an atom. And what do you notice here? I hope what you notice is that this is a very simple, repeat, very ordered structure. You have long range across this whole little piece here of the same arrangement of these atoms or molecules. It's regular, regular long range order. That's really important, right? So for crystalline, we're gonna talk about regular, and we mean long range across the entire material long range order and that's really important long range order now if you compare that to amorphous materials amorphous materials may have the same composition right this ball is the same for this model the same color it could be the same atoms or the same molecules but the three-dimensional arrangement i know this is a two-dimensional piece of uh, paper or screen but you have to think about these things being three dimensions. Um, what do you notice here? Well, the same material, but the way that they're arranged is quite different in the amorphous form than the crystalline. If you look in the crystalline, hopefully for those of you that are visual learners like me, you can really see that across this whole material, you've got um, this same repeat pattern, the same packing. You know, you have one ball here surrounded by six neighbors and that's repeated over and over and over again. That's really important. But if you look here, some of these balls, they're, they're not only maybe connected to one or two or three things. You don't have the same long range order. If you were to take this part, it does not have the exact same layout as this part, where if you go back to the crystalline material, if I circle this, it has the exact same layout as this area over here. So that's what I mean when I talk about the long range order. It's a repeat arrangement that is found throughout the entire material. Now, this is sort of an idealized case, right? These are the two extremes. You have crystalline and amorphous. 
Now, within amorphous materials, you have so many different varieties. You could teach a whole course on amorphous materials, and there are lots of really important ones. Amorphous materials are very commonly formed when you take a liquid and you cool it down and it arranges into a solid, but it's not very ordered. Um, you might think of this as oftentimes uh, if you have something like wax. If you cool wax down, it's going to be an amorphous material. It's not going to be crystalline. Um, and it has very different properties than something that's crystalline. If you think about, um, we'll use silicon dioxide in a minute, silica, where you can have both the same empirical formula, SiO2, and it can be both crystalline and amorphous, as we'll see in a minute. If you look in your reading, if you want to be challenged, go to the very end of the reading. You'll see how you can take crystalline materials and think about how you can introduce very small scale defects and that can change properties as well but don't worry about that right now i think that's kind of a challenge section of your reading i think it's really cool and we'll talk about next time how it becomes really important but for right now know that for crystalline materials long range order repeats across the whole material in all three dimensions amorphous materials it's it's varied highly variable sometimes across the material really important there all right so like i said i promised you a specific example um, this material is actually a model of silicon dioxide. This is known as silica and more commonly known, and we're going to talk about gems and crystals later on, this is quartz. Quartz has a very regular long range order where here you have the silicon, right? The silicons are these peach color and these um, reds, right, are going to be your oxygens. and Roughly speaking, if you kind of look over the whole thing, it's roughly a two to one ratio. Remember, this is a, an empirical formula, right? And we're looking at the material all the way across, right? So there's a silicon here and a silicon there, right? And if you look over here, this is what's called um, oftentimes fused silica. Now again, they are both are silicon dioxide but in this case, the quartz material, and I apologize, this is a very kind of zoomed in view. I wish I could have zoomed out and shown you a longer range, uh, bigger piece of the crystal in this case on the left. But here you can see you form these sort of hexagonal structures roughly, uh, and those repeat, are repeated across the whole material. Um, but if you look over here in the case of fused silica, fused silica has these weird kind of jumbles where some form these irregular cavities, and it's just a big old mess. Um, it's still a really neat material, but it's not the same. And so these different three-dimensional structures, the arrangements of the silicon dioxide um, units across the material can cause it to have very different properties. And so quartz, if you've looked at it, you've probably seen a quartz crystal. It has that really neat hexagonal uh, structure, um, and, and part of it's a result of the way these are packed. If you look at fused silica, it has a very different structure at the molecular scale, and those properties manifest themselves in a very deliberate way. And so sometimes you want to use quartz for some applications and sometimes fused silica for others. Now, in no way in this course are we going to spend uh, our time trying to figure out exactly when you would use one versus the other. The goal here is not to have you memorize every little waking detail. The goal here is to kind of think about big picture things and to be able to take away some general concepts so that you can solve um, larger questions in terms of trends and not try to memorize things. So let me show you some additional examples that maybe connect to 111. All right. And I don't know where my screen went there. Okay, sorry, I must have skipped a page. All right. I'm going to focus more on crystalline materials because they're a lot more interesting and they connect more to a lot of the things that we talked about in 111. In fact, this is a uh, table directly from your 111 textbook. Uh, and so I want to talk about it for a little bit. We talked about metallic materials, right? And so, uh, again, these are all crystalline materials, right? They have a long range order, really important. Uh, we're not going to really talk about amorphous materials much anymore. Um, now, metallic materials, right? You want to think about things like sodium metal, magnesium metal, aluminum, iron, tin, copper, silver, tungsten, right? You know these are transition metals, a lot of them, and some are main group metals, but they all have this crystalline structure. And metals, oh my goodness, we could talk a whole semester about the individual crystal unit cells of different metals. And, you know, you feel free to go look on, it's worth a Google, right? You can go check it out. But we talked about metals quite a bit, right? Metals vary a little bit. You have some like 
uh, sodium and lithium that are very soft, they might have a low melting point, but then you have some that are very hard, right? You know, like, like maybe tungsten is a really hard metal, titanium is pretty hard. Um, they're good conductors. And remember we talked about this electron C model, right? That was really important. We review your notes if you don't remember. The electron C model where you have delocalized electrons that can flow across and that's why they end up becoming very good conductors. And so the type of material here will be called metallic. It's held together by metallic bonds through the electron C model. And here are some typical properties of metal. And we've already talked about transition metals a lot, so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on that. Now, if we come down here, we'll talk about the next one, which are ionic materials, right? Ionic materials are typically your salts, right? Oftentimes they are your salts, and that's really important. Um, you know, we talked about sodium chloride, magnesium oxide, sodium nitrate, a lot of these things you use in the lab. We've covered a lot of these, magnesium sulfate, uh, potassium phosphate, all kinds of things, right? Now, it's important to remember back to your 111 days that these are held together not by, repeat, not by covalent bonds, but they're held together by electrostatic attractions. So that means essentially you're looking at the attraction of positive and negative charges. And these things actually have really, really strong attractions, right? And they form crystals. And we talked a little bit about the crystal structure of things like salt and things like that before. These are often going to be very hard, very brittle materials, very, very high melting points, right? They're not going to be typically very good conductors. They're going to be very brittle, right? They will shatter. If you try to bend a piece of sodium uh, chloride crystal, you're going to snap it. It's going to break, um, you know, all kinds of things. And so uh, some of them are water soluble, some are not, right? We talked about KSP values for things that are not soluble. And we've talked about solubility rules way back in the day. So you can predict which things are soluble. So ionic material salts are governed by the arrangement of really kind of a neat uh, interplay between how do you arrange the cations and the anions within a crystal. And I'll give you some examples of that later. Now, if you move on to some that maybe are less um, familiar to you, one of my favorites are uh, the network, covalent network uh, materials. And these are very different from ionic materials because these are bound through direct covalent bonds, sharing, right? And so you have a huge range here. But if you look at a trend here, look at diamond, graphite, right? Silicon carbide, aluminum nitride, silica, right? The silicon dioxide showed you up above on the previous page. That is, you guessed it, a covalent network material. These are often very hard. Uh, they oftentimes don't even really melt. They sublime. They go directly from a solid to a gas. Um, and most of them are not conductors, right? Now, granted, Graphite in the pencil, right? It's a pretty good, you make graphite electrodes all the time. Uh, that's a conductor, but generally an exception, right? Boron nitride's a good one, right? Very high uh, thermal uh, insulators, right? For like space shuttle tiles are made of boron nitride and things like that. If you've ever done a, a woodworking project, you probably use silicon carbide sandpaper, um, all kinds of things, right? Carbide drilled bits, all kinds of things, really hard materials. And then uh, you get to the ones that are weaker materials. And I think it's really important to kind of look above. These first three deal with pretty strong bonds, right? But now we get to things that are not going to have formal bonds. They are going to depend, essentially depend on intermolecular forces to hold them together. And if you remember from 111, there is a huge diversity of intermolecular forces. Some are really, really strong, like hydrogen bonding. Some are very, very weak, like London dispersion forces. And so if you have nonpolar constituents, like atoms or nonpolar molecules, right? Remember, you need to go back and think about how you can identify which intermolecular forces are present in a molecule. Um, you need to be able to do that. So if we look at something like nonpolar uh, atoms or molecules, you can look at things like helium, argon, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, uh, tetrachloro, uh, methane, methane and iodine, right? These are going to be things that are held together very tenuously, right? They're not going to have a huge attraction for each other because they're all nonpolar. And the only thing, the, repeat, the only thing holding them together will be your London dispersion forces. And if you remember dispersion forces, right, are very, very weak interactions, really, really weak. And that means if your solid is held together by weak interactions, well, what are your properties going to be? Well, it's not going to be a very strong material. Um, you're going to have soft materials, extremely low melting points. I mean, a lot of these are not going to want to be solids to begin with. I mean, if you're going to tell me, 
When is helium a solid? Well, it's got to be pretty darn close to four, kel or to four Kelvin or below. It's extremely cold temperatures. Why is that? Because these solids are held together by very, very weak forces, and any little bit of thermal energy you give them will break them apart. They'll go flying everywhere. They'll want to be a gas, I promise you, um, or a liquid in the case of carbon tetrachloride. Now, Again, uh, you know these things are nonpolar and they're held together by weak dispersion forces. And if you want to, you can call these LDF, London dispersion forces. But nonpolar atoms or nonpolar molecules form these weak uh, molecular uh, solids that are basically brought together by the weakest of the intermolecular forces, the dispersion forces. Remember, if we move up to polar molecules, now we have both dispersion and dipole-dipole. But clearly dipole-dipole will take over here because it's the most significant if you have these two. And here you begin to look at things like, uh, you know, you've got uh, methane, you've got a, what is it, a chloroform here, uh, or you can do trichloromethane. You've got some HCl if you form crystals. And again, we're forming solids here again, right? This is what, um, you've got uh, ether here, all kinds of things. Again, dipole-dipole are gonna be stronger, but those solids are still not gonna be held together so strong, but they're held more strongly than the dispersion forces. So they're gonna have higher melting points, but overall, still pretty low. Um, not nearly as strong as the ones we talked about way up above, right? Um, and then finally, once you get things that are both polar and, so I need to put this in here, it has to be both polar and, has an H bonded to a NOF, an N, O, or an F. In that case, you will develop hydrogen bonds. But remember, you have hydrogen bonds, you have London dispersion forces, and you have dipole-dipole. And that's really important to remember all three are present. However, the hydrogen bonds are gonna dominate because they are by far the strongest. And now you get things that are gonna be held together as a solid, remember we're talking about solids, much more strongly. If you look at ice, right, and oh my God, let me tell you, you can go and read volumes and volumes and volumes of literature articles about ice. Ice is an amazing substance for reasons I can't have, I don't have time to go in here, but ice is a really important material. Um, and you know how strong ice can be. And so ice is just water, but it's held together by hydrogen bonds in the solid state. And it forms these really beautiful hexagonal crystals. Go Google ice, Google the structure of ice. It'll be worth your time, go do it um, and check it out. So again, just to review, you've got metallic, ionic, and network covalent, and these are gonna be your strongest ones. Okay, and those are pretty strong if you had to roughly rank them. And then oftentimes these molecular materials are gonna be pretty weak, okay? In terms of what's holding them together. Now let's try to look at some examples, right? So here's an example of salt, right? Sodium chloride. And if you look at sodium chloride, remember some of you still want to write something like that. Never do that because there's no covalent bonds in salt. Those are held together purely by electrostatic interactions. And if you look at the crystal structure, right, you can look at the long range order. There's no accident that sodium chloride salt crystals form a cubic crystal. And that's because they have a cubic um, basis for their unit cell. That is the repeating unit across the whole crystal. And we will talk about unit cells n uh, next week. But for right now, I just want to show you, I mean, look here, you got a chloro right here, a chloride here in the middle, and it's attracted to one, two, three, four, five, six. It's essentially a chloride in the middle of an octahedron of sodium ions. And you could do the same thing for sodium, right? You can look at the sodium and here's a plus and it's in an octahedron. If this one were to come out, there'd be a chloro here. There'd be an octahedron of chlorides. And so this repeat unit is very crystalline, right? It's very well ordered, really important. Um, and so here you can look at the space filling where we just look at it to and totally in terms of the packing of the electrostatic, you know, you have a, a negative and a positive. And I hate this drawing, you can probably guess why, right? Do you see the mistake they made? What happens when you go from a sodium to a sodium plus? Does it get bigger or smaller? It gets smaller, right? Because you're removing a shell. If you've got a chloride and you add an electron, usually things get bigger. And so I, I think they might have uh, fudged the, the drawing here. And I think the green one might've been a little bit bigger than the purple one, but I'm just being nitpicky here. All I really care about here is letting you know that you have this really definite repeat structure across the whole crystal. And that's why 
uh, sodium chloride is a crystalline solid. Now, what kind is it? It's an ionic solid. So now you can begin to classify things. First of all, is something crystalline or amorphous? Okay, sodium chloride is crystalline. Why? Because it has this repeat structure. Now, what kind of crystalline material is it? It is a ionic solid because you have electrostatic attractions between cations and anions. Really important that you begin to kind of classify these in your head. Okay, if you move into something simple like um, your, your metallic materials we were talking about, right? So here's copper. Copper is a really good example. Um, if you think about that, um, now copper has, um, oh no, there we go. Copper has this really neat structure here. And again, we'll talk more about the unit cell later on, and that's really important. But if you think about it, we've got this really nice repeat structure, and you can look at how, if you look at this cube of copper atoms, it has a really unique structure that is repeated throughout the whole thing. Looks like a little board cube here if you're into Star Trek. Um, but it has a very definite repeat structure, entirely composed of copper uh, cations in the electron C model. So this would be a crystalline material, copper. What kind of crystalline material? This would have been metallic solid, obviously, because it's only made of copper. Pretty easy. Held together by what kind of bonds? Metallic bonds, right? That C of electron model. Good conductor. Strong. High melting point. Really important. Um, you can get into some really cool ones, right? Really useful ones here. And so here's a good example. You've got um, some covalent network ones, right? So here's carbon arranged in a tetrahedral. And if you look at this repeat, here's a tetrahedron, here's a tetrahedron, here's a tetrahedron, here's another one. Repeated through the whole thing. That's what we know as diamond, right? And diamond is like one of the biggest scams in the world. It's terrible, right? Um, trust me, as someone who had to go buy a diamond uh, one day to, to ask a, a girl that he really loves to marry him, diamonds are, are, man, you're paying a lot of money for a little chunk of carbon. It pisses me off. But anyway, carbon's cool. Um, you know, if you if, if any of you are in the, ever getting into the, the business of, of thinking about, you know, uh, settling down with somebody, you'll you'll hear the four, the four C's, right, of, of diamonds, right? It's gonna be a uh, carat, right? A carat is how big of a diamond it is, how much mass. A carat, I think, is about 200 milligrams, right? Um, the cut, what shape it is, uh, the clarity, how pure the diamond is, and then finally, um, let's see, what is it? Uh, carat, cut, clarity, and color. How, how, how many impurities are in there? What kind of impurities give it a color? To be honest, another big scam, if you've ever seen someone try to sell chocolate diamonds or any of that kind of garbage, those are actually rather impure diamonds. They have impurities that make them that kind of brown color and the, the jewelry industry has figured out that people are suckers and if you just tell them to you know, uh, buy these chocolate diamonds, they can charge you more for them. So don't fall for that crap. Um, anyway, I digress, sorry. Um, and you look here and you can look at silicon dioxide, quartz, right? And you've got the repeating structure here. And this is a much better picture than the one I showed you before because it really shows you that three-dimensional repeat structure. Kind of hard to tell, I know. If you look at silicon carbide, you'll notice it shares the same structure as diamond, this kind of repeat tetrahedral arrangement. Uh, you'll see this is very common in, in nature. This is called an adamantane structure. No, it's not adamantium like Wolverine's claws. It's called adamantane structure, uh, named after something else that we won't talk about, but this repeat structure is pretty cool. And then finally, right, you have a different allotrope, right? An allotrope, right? Allotrope, do you know what those are? Allotrope. Allotropes are essentially a polymorph or an arrangement, a different arrangement of uh, atoms within a structure, right? So if you look at diamond, right, it's all carbons. Graphite are all, car all carbons as well, but they're different arrangements. And also remember, we can draw the structure here. These are sp2 carbons, whereas all the carbons in diamond are sp3. And graphite actually arranges itself into these beautiful sheets. And these nice sheets have uh, many, 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 many resonance structures which allow it to be conductive. And so here you see, I think, a really in-your-face example as to why carbon in the form of graphite is a conductor where carbon in the form of diamond is an insulator. And that's really important for you to know. Um, in your reading, it talks a little bit about some other allotropes of, of carbon. Uh, if you've ever seen uh, buckyballs or fullerenes, right? You might have heard if you're a if you're someone who enjoys soccer, right? You might have heard of C60. It's a soccer ball-shaped molecule of carbon. 
A whole family of these really important. I used to do some research with these where we try to make anti-cancer drugs and we put different radioactive materials inside of them so that the carbon cage could carry them around. And then once it was done, you just pee them out, which is really cool. Uh, carbon nanotubes, uh, these big kind of chicken wire tubes. It's like graphite kind of wrapped in a tube. And then finally, uh, just recently, graphene has become the, the hotness, right? Uh, graphene is, is just kind of a super material now that people are really excited about using. And it essentially looks like one sheet of graphite if you want to look at it that way. It's a very simplistic idea, but you can do some reading on your own. Carbon's really pretty badass. Um, and so anyway, those are your covalent networks. And then finally, you know, we can look at some of the the relatively weaker molecular solids, right? So you can have solid carbon dioxide, and I hope you know what that is. Car solid carbon dioxide is what? That's dry ice, right? That's that's dry ice. If you've ever used dry ice at a party or Halloween haunted house to make the kind of fog effect, uh, you've used um, you know solid carbon dioxide. And here you can see the individual carbon dioxide molecules in a repeat crystalline structure across this whole thing. Um, but again. It doesn't last very long. Carbon dioxide is is pretty unhappy. It's not the most stable form of carbon at room temperature because you give these carbon, uh, sorry, these carbon dioxide molecules enough energy, and they're going to vibrate loose and overcome the um, intermolecular forces. In this case, if you look at it, right, remember your Lewis structures. If you can draw, you know, we'll go ahead and draw the lone pairs to be careful here. That's a nonpolar molecule, right? Granted, there are two polar bonds, but overall, they're pointed in two different directions. You've got you know, your partial negative over here and partial negative over here, and they cancel each other. So that's a nonpolar molecule. So the only thing holding these things together are London dispersion forces, and those are weak as all hell. So any little bit of thermal energy is gonna break this apart. And as you know, at room temperature and pressure, carbon dioxide is much more uh, stable in the gas form. Iodine, if you've ever seen crystals of iodine, right? You look at the I2 molecule, and so here you can look at, right, this guy here. Um, these are gonna be very, um, you know, I would argue that maybe in the way this is depicted, this would be more of an amorphous material because in this case, the way this is drawn, and again, you can have lots of different structures for the same uh, molecule. You can have crystalline forms of things and amorphous forms of things. You just have to kind of look. But I would argue this form of iodine is, is pretty much um, amorphous. I do not see a regular repeat structure. Um, you know, I'm not saying there can't be, but this one, at least to me, doesn't look like a, a really strong repeat unit. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe my eyes are just tired this time of night, but maybe you can see order, but I don't really see order right here. Okay. Now, beyond your reading, um, what am I actually good for? Well, um, I, I kind of like to show you some things that are really exciting and worth your time. And um, if you looked at this structure over here, you can see some pretty cool examples of really unique structures. And so this is calcium titanate, and it is a mineral, and it comes in this form here. And these really cool cubes look like they're almost like alien technology or something, but this is how it's found in nature, this calcium titanate. And here's the actual repeat structure. You have these giant calcium ions, right? These calcium two plus ions in the, um, in the material um surrounded by what um oh excuse me i got it wrong here we go we got yeah calcium is here let me kind of give you a key here we've got um calcium is the counter ion and it's probably in here right here and then we've probably got let me see what do we got here we got some titanium oxide pieces here so yeah i think the calcium is going to be here no, it's right there. And here's titanium. Sorry, I'm getting a little confused a little bit late. Sorry for this. The uh, main thing I want to show you is that you can see this is the, the structure that's going to be repeated over and over and over again. And it forms these calcium titanate structures. Now, the cool thing is um, people who were studying these, and I'm not a geochemist, and you can clearly tell by my terrible description of this, um, gemstones and minerals you find, many of them are, are highly ordered, highly crystalline materials. Some will be rather amorphous. In this case, the calcium titanate is rather structured, really crystalline. This is the repeat unit that gets repeated over and over and over again to actually form this material. And so people were inspired by this material. And if you look over here, you'll see this. This is known as a perovskite structure, kind of very similar to the perovskite structure over here. It's kind of a complicated crystal structure. Don't worry, I'm not gonna make you have to draw it. But here, this one, I've actually labeled it for you to make sure you kind of understand it better than the calcium titanate one. Look at this one, this is insane. This whole structure here, 
This is the repeat structure for the whole thing. And the empirical formula is up here. And so if you get a little, I don't know if you can see down here, this black disc is the superconductor. This is the yttrium, barium, copper, oxide. And the cool thing here is these are called one, two, three superconductors. So yttrium one, barium two, copper three, oxygen we're not really so worried about. That's a seven. It's just there to balance the charges or whatnot. But this material is actually really important. These are superconductors and superconductors have really unique properties where essentially if you cool them down and one of the first superconductors discovered was actually liquid mercury. Kind of crazy. You have to cool it down to like liquid helium temperature, like 4K to get it to be superconducting. Um, but these that I'm showing you here, these yttrium, barium, copper oxide, perovskite structures, they won a Nobel Prize uh, for being high temperature uh, super uh, conductors, And those are really important. I think it was like 1987 they won a Nobel Prize. And, and these things are so important because what happens is they're often used to be um, to build superconducting magnets or maglevs and all kinds of things. If you've ever seen the trains in Japan, I put a link in the, the canvas. So go go watch that little two minute video and, and learn a little bit more about the uses of superconductors. The NMR on the third floor of Hayes has a superconducting magnet. Um, MRIs, if you've ever thought about healthcare, uh, MRIs run off of a superconducting magnet. All kinds of amazing things run off of superconductors. Um, they're really important because if you cool them down below their critical temperature, they essentially re re they lose all resistance to electron flow. And that's really pretty cool. And if you look here, you can see this is a, a magnet. This is a neodymium magnet that's levitated over a superconductor because what happens, this is known as the Meissner effect. If you drop a, a strong magnet onto a superconductor, the movement, the moving magnetic field can, can generate an electronic field that then can move without resistance through the super, superconductor and set up an equal and opposite magnetic field because the moving electric field creates a magnetic field and you can levitate um, these magnets. And so if you've ever seen these bullet trains in Japan, they're called maglevs, where these, these trains quite literally levitate over the track by using superconductors. And they're really cool. And they have really exotic structures. And um, I used to know some folks at the University of Houston that, that were, were working on these. And man, they would have these ovens and they would come up with all these kind of crazy formulas and they would bake these things and quite literally put them in an oven at thousands of degrees to make these things. I've done it a couple of times, a lot of fun. Um, and you can levitate these magnets and it, it's really cool chemistry, but at the same time, the engineering behind it is outstanding because the connection to physics to make things that are quite useful. Um, I don't know, it gets me excited and I hope you can go look at that video. Um, I've spent probably too much time on this, so I'll move over. One of the things I promised to tell you about was uh, silicon chemistry and I'm not going to spend too much time and, and okay obviously this is you know FYI this is just for your information not on exam okay but we live in a technological boom era I mean the era of silicon based electronics has just taken over our life I mean from the cell phone to your car to um, the ability to do remote surgery, to GPS. Having silicon-based electronics has fundamentally changed the world that we live in and the world that you grew up in. Um, could you imagine the world without computers or without cell phones or without, I mean, it would just be a different world. Oftentimes people will say that carbon is the element of life. I would argue that silicon is the element of civilization. Without silicon-based electronics, we would not have the modern life that we enjoy now. And this is really important. So one thing I wanna kinda of tell you about is where do these silicon crystals come from? And silicon crystals have the same structure as diamond, most of them, um, but instead of a carbon, it's based on silicon. And so what you do is you go to the beach, right? And you, and you dig up what? Well, you dig up a bunch of sand or quartz. You take that and you're gonna do a redox reaction, right? You're gonna take this with carbon, you're gonna reduce the silicon from silicon four plus to silicon zero, you're gonna oxidize the carbon to form carbon monoxide. This is not a very huh, easy reaction. Look at the temperatures, man, crazy. And you do this in a big giant vault. 
Um, this just like a vat, like a ceramic crucible, it's super high temperatures, right? And that will give you silicon, elemental silicon from sand. Really pretty cool because uh, there's lots of sand on the planet, right? Silicon, uh, after oxygen, silicon is one of the most abundant elements. There is crust, really easy to find. However, at that point, you've made pretty impure silicon. And so that's not good enough for computer chips. So look what you have to do. You have to take that silicon you made and react it with gas, not liquid, gas HCl, and you form these silanes. And these chlorosilane molecules are in gases and you have some H uh, generated as well. A little bit milder conditions. And then you take this gas and purify it and it becomes used in the next step where you take that and you heat the hell out of it. You heat it at like over a thousand degrees, decompose it, you generate the HCl back, some of this uh, tetrachlorosilane, but you generate this very, very pure, what I will call electronics grade silicon and check it out. How many nines pass the decimal? Three, three, three. That's nine nines pass the decimal. You're talking parts per billion purity. Electronics grade silicon, whether you know it or not, is the purest routinely available material on this planet. And the reason it has to be that pure is because you have to control uh, the doping. That means you have to go back and add element impurities into it to control the conductivity or the properties you need for your um, computer chip application. And if you've ever gone to a place like Mitsubishi or in Asia, they have a lot of these uh, fabrication labs where they actually grow silicon crystals. It's amazing. They have these giant vats. And if you look at this giant log, this thing is one crystal, one continuous crystal of silicon started up here from this little seed crystal. They dip into a vat and they slowly over a period of about two days, 48 hours, pull this thing out. And it's about, it can be up to 12 feet long and about 12 inches uh, in diameter. And then what they do is they take it and they take diamond tip saws and they chop it all up to give you these beautiful uh, wafers. This thing here is called an ingot. You don't need to know that, but if you care, this is called an ingot, a log of silicon, and then you chop it up and you have wafers. And that gentleman is how they then go and give these to Intel or AMD and they make those beautiful chips that run your cell phones and your computers and every other device that we know. You may not know it, but your car, your washing machine, your alarm clock all have silicon chips in there. Pretty amazing. So again, you do not need to know the specific reactions, but I think it's pretty cool. And you should know that silicon, elemental silicon is actually oftentimes a very crystalline and very important material. The last thing I wanted to share with you, just because I think it's pretty badass, are gemstones. The chemistry of gemstones is pretty amazing. Now, a lot of gemstones are crystal materials, but I will tell you that some are gonna be um, amorphous. For right now, I'm gonna focus on a few that I think are crystalline that you would really enjoy. Now, opal is oftentimes uh, the one in here, that's often amorphous, but check it out. You have things like pearls, right? Pearls are, uh, they can be either synthetic or um, artificial, right? And they're nothing but calcium carbonate. Um, and, and these can often be um, uh, a variety of materials. But one thing I wanted to point to was, if you look at something like, oh, I don't know, look at amethyst. So I was born in February, um, and so amethyst is my birthstone. It is what? It is silicon dioxide. So is citrine. Very different colors, and why is that? Well they have the same material, silicon dioxide, both based off of quartz. And if you look at in regular pure quartz, it's colorless, right? Clear and colorless. You can see through it, it's clear, and it has no visible color, so it's colorless. Um, but if you look at amethyst, um, it has a little bit of a purple tint to it, or maybe a lot of a purple tint to it. And that comes from the fact that you end up taking that beautiful silicon quartz, uh, silicon dioxide quartz structure and you introduce impurities of iron. And those impurities change the structure and give you a different color. If you look at citrine, right, you end up having aluminum and iron, or uh, some of both, it depends, um, and that gives you a yellow color. Really quite amazing. If you look over here, and again, no, you don't have to, all right, you do not have to memorize all of the elements that are in every little thing. Don't worry about that. Um, but things, look at this. Here's aquamarine and here's emerald. They are both identical structures. 
they have the same crystalline formula, the same crystal or same empirical formula and the same crystalline structure, but they differ only by what? In the case of aquamarine, you have iron impurities. In the case of emerald, you have oftentimes chromium and aluminum, right? All kinds of amazing things, pretty cool. Um, you know, if you look here, you've got your aluminums in, that are replaced by iron, and then aluminums replaced by chromium. And again, the difference in the amount of chromium or iron you have determines how light or dark they are. Pretty cool stuff. And if you think about it, you can think about how our crystal field theory, you can kind of apply that to the color of these gems. And that was one of the things that drove uh, the discovery or the formulation of crystal field theory back in the day that when they did it, because they thought, well, if these ions are causing color shifts, um, they might end up forming these complexes that we can explain based on what we talked about way back then, because here's iron and chromium. We're forming maybe these little complexes within the crystal structure. So kind of a cool thing to think about connecting back to what we did before. And the last ones I'll, I'll talk about right here are two of my favorites, ruby and sapphire are both alumina structures. The, um, the, the mineral name of these is called corundum. It's a very strong material. I think it's, it's um, what, about nine on the Mohs scale of hardness, um, really durable materials. But if you think about it, both rubies and sapphires have the same chemical formula and they have the same crystal structure. The only difference is, is that the red color in ruby is caused by aluminums being replaced by chromiums within the crystal structure. And the sapphire is the same thing, except the aluminum is replaced with titanium. And that's really cool. So if you look down here, I've actually dug up the crystal structure for you to show you. Look at the long range repeat order here of the corundum, the aluminum oxide structure. And the only difference is, is a little bit of the impurity. And where do those impurities show up? Well, if you go to the end of the reading, uh, I've sent you on Canvas. It's, it's, it shows you how impurities and defects in a crystal can have consequences. And here's a really good example of that. And then, of course, diamond is one of the hardest materials, if not uh, one of the hardest naturally occurring materials on the planet. Um, there you go. Now, somebody always asks me about stained glass. Glass in the window that you have is typically not a crystalline material. It's often more amorphous. Um, however, for amorphous materials, you can still have impurities that can change the properties, especially the optical properties. And so if you've ever wondered in, you know, the beautiful churches in Italy and um, London and, and, and just amazing places in the United States, right? A lot of times these beautiful stained glass windows you'll see, even dating, even dating back to the, the Renaissance and medieval times was all based upon impurities uh, worked into the different kinds of glass they use to give you different colors. So um, I hope that you will enjoy this um, connection between the stuff we're studying. And I tried to point out things in your world that uh, are influenced by crystalline materials. I'm sure you can look around your world and find examples uh, that I haven't talked about. So please do the reading. Please check out the couple of videos. Please definitely keep up with the class. I know it's hard to stay focused. Dr. Cook gave you some good advice. Try to stay uh, in a regimen, you know, get a schedule down and stick with it. I know it's hard to stay motivated, but please do your best. Know that Dr. Cook and I care about you guys and we want to help you. So please don't ever hesitate to reach out to us. We are doing our best. We are, we take this job very seriously and we want to help you learn, especially in these trying times. So um, hopefully you can look to us for some sense of a regular, um, part of life in this world that's been kind of turned upside down by this coronavirus. So let us help you. Let us help you learn. And uh, we're here to do our best to help you on this journey to get to the end of the semester. So again, please remember there's no SAP in assignment due on Friday. However, but you, you do need to go download and print out and complete the very, very short uh, assignment I've given you. Scan it, resubmit back on uh, Canvas and we'll grade those and move along. So hang in there, take care. And um, the other thing I wanted to say is thank you very much for the good work on your literature article selections. I got really psyched reading many of those when you submitted because, you know, I, I, I have found great joy in some of the beautiful and really exciting articles you found, lots of cool structures. Some of you have found chemotherapy agents. Some of you found amazing structures for, you know, all kinds of applications. And so I was really pleased for 
those of you that really took this seriously, thank you for your hard work. And I look forward to seeing how that project develops and seeing how you get excited about some of the stuff you're reading about in your research articles. So um, I'm just about at time here. So um, I will probably plan to hold some kind of um, conference, uh, perhaps on Friday. We'll see. Uh, I'll see if it's it's if it's worth it for just this one lecture. If not, just shoot me an email, or if you want to chat, we can set up a chat. But um, I think most of this was pretty straightforward, and I hope the homework assignment will help you um, test your own understanding, and and we'll move on. So uh, Dr. Cook's going to take it back on Friday, and then I will be back for next week to talk about the crystal cells in the unit cells and more of the detail and the nitty gritty about how we can actually look at these things on a little bit more sophisticated level. So I hope today was a good introduction and you got something out of it. So until then, stay strong, stay well, stay safe, social distancing for the win. Take care. Bye-bye.